First of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for the other presenters who will be speaking after us. Uh, thank you to Imperial for hosting us, obviously. And I know a lot of uh, work goes behind the scene in, in organizing these things, sending out the invitations, managing the, the list. So thank you to the Crypto Compare guys, especially Vlad, for doing this month after month for the, for the last, I don't know how many years. Uh, I have been attending the Ethereum meetups for the past two years, and I, I, I normally sit at the back and, and keep quiet. So it's, it's, you know, it's a nice opportunity for me to actually take the stage and present to the community about what project, uh, the project we're working on. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, our, our company is uh, Tramonex, and we're going to uh, present, uh, we, we have a presentation we want to show you, and then we'll open it to uh, Q&A. Uh, and uh, we, we work in the payment space. Uh, specifically, we, we have an existing uh, business in international payments where we can execute the foreign exchange. Uh, our clients are uh, in, uh, mainly in continental Europe, emerging markets, Africa, businesses that do import-export, uh, shipping companies, airlines, a, a variety of corporates. We're, we're very much B2B. Uh, and uh, as we built this business over the last two years, we had to develop uh, a lot of internal uh, uh, procedures about AML, compliance, risk, etc. And we obviously we have been working with the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, very closely. We, we are regulated and our license is passported across uh, all EU countries. Uh, so last year we were doing a bit of research and development uh, in terms of what are the emerging technologies that will have a big business, on our, a big impact on our international payments business. And you know you, you 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 cannot escape coming across blockchain. It's 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 in the news. It's in uh, academic publications. You you cannot escape uh, noticing it. And uh, we, as we did our research, we noticed. Uh, so we are we are we are familiar with uh, the existing uh, problems in the existing banking uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, which is sort of one side of the slide. And then we discovered that uh, this emerging uh, blockchain cryptocurrency space uh, also has some, some problems. So namely on the banking side, uh, you have uh, often clients have to wait for two days when you're in emerging markets up to five days to receive the payments. Uh, there is no way to, to track the payment. So you don't know if it's, if it's the, sitting with the uh, the bank in your country with the bank in the other country is it is it you know what is it waiting for which is amazing because if if, if you look at uh, UPS and uh, postal parcels you can track them every step of the way they get scanned every step of the way you you know if your parcel is in in the delivery van in the distribution center whether it's been picked up what time it's been picked up the name of the driver but when it comes to payments it's it's a bit of a black hole so the money goes in and hopefully a few days later it comes out in the right place. <laughs> and, and, and the amount of uh, sort of exceptions and issues that arise, uh, to give you an example, if, if, you're, if you're a company and you're making a payment of uh, 300,000 uh, pounds and you want to convert it to euro, uh, to fund your account you have to send 300 pounds. If you say, if you send 325 pounds, chances are the payment will be rejected and then because of the 25 pounds excess and then you have to do it again. And each time you do it, there's fees involved, there's time involved, people, phone calls, etc. So in theory, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies can address a lot of these issues uh, in terms of providing transparency, in terms of providing speed, especially I'm, I'm, I'm referring to uh, public blockchains, not, not the private permission blockchains. Uh, so, so, so that's great. We, wh why, why don't we all start using uh, cryptocurrency and Ethereum to transact? Well, so it turns out that cryptocurrencies are in a regulatory gray zone. So in other words, if, if uh, it's not very clear, are the exchanges regulated that trade in cryptocurrencies? Once you have cryptocurrency, it's not very clear, well, what, what rights do you have uh, as a consumer? Is there a public body you can turn to if, if things go wrong? And uh, I mean, regulators in many countries and central banks are watching this space and, and regulation is evolving, but at the moment it's a gray zone. So we came along, we, we studied very closely the technology, uh, we have uh, our existing uh, business, so we, we put the two together and decided, well, is there some way to bridge these two? Is there some way to do crypto in a regulated way? So that is our, our solution. We try to position ourselves as a bridge between the regulated financial 
system and uh, uh, you know blockchain blockchain based payment uh, uh, services uh, and 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 the way this works in the in the context of uh, ethereum it's if you go on the ethereum web page you will the first thing you will learn is how to issue your own digital token on the ethereum blockchain it's very straightforward uh, the the problem is that token normally doesn't have any value doesn't mean anything so we're giving value to our token by holding collateral in, in fiat at a segregated bank account. And we're able to do that because of our regulated status and because of our uh, knowledge and expertise in, in the traditional uh, banking environment. Um, okay. And, and why, why, why do we do this? Uh, we think it will enable a lot of new businesses uh, things like uh, micropayments, which are currently very difficult to do because of the, uh, the cost of processing a payment. Uh, so, so in theory, blockchain should bring a significant cost advantage to uh, blockchain-based payment systems. Uh, but also, as we know, Ethereum is natively enabled for smart contracts. And later tonight, we will hear about uh, various smart contract projects that other companies are working, working on. And a uh, pain point for many of these projects is if they need to move money, they either somehow need to interface the blockchain with a bank API, which, which, which bank APIs are very, very notoriously difficult to get hold of. Uh, or if someone like us can provide a digital token directly on the Ethereum contract, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, you can, your smart contracts can interface directly with them. So whether it's an insurance contract that, that needs to co collect premiums or make a payout, whether it's just a direct uh, payment uh, linked to your card, uh, whether it's something more complex, like uh, we, we'll show you an example later of uh, uh, sort of uh, government money, how you can restrict the uses of, of uh, money. So, so in effect, you know, on, on the blockchain, so, so we want to have the benefits of uh, national currencies because people understand what they are. You know, people understand pound sterling, people understand US dollar, people don't understand Bitcoin unless you spend five hours explaining it to them. And then they still have their reservations. Uh, on the other hand, blockchain is, is a fantastic, and, and Ethereum especially is a fantastic technology with, with a lot of uh, benefits built into it. So, I mean, these, these are some of the, the, the benefits of uh, this kind of arrangement. Uh, you can see it enables quite quite a few things. So, w what I'm hoping is people who are who are uh, working on very smart contract ideas or, or other business plans where the the pain point is the actual moving of the money, uh, we please come and talk to us afterwards because we we potentially have a way for you to do it directly on the blockchain, which means you know nearly instantaneous and you know transparent, immutable, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that's from me. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Dave, our CTO, uh, to walk you through uh, a few more slides, and then, and then I'll come back later, I think. All right. All right, that's quite a big question. I'm not hugely familiar with these slides, so you're going to have to bear with me. But actually, if we, go, if we, if we do stick on how does it actually work, the, one of the things I like about the model we've come up with is it's very, very simple. Um, anyone who has done any Solidity development at all will be very familiar with a Solidity token um, or the, the Ethereum token, as Nick uh, pointed out, rolling out your beloved unicorn token is probably the first thing you're going to do if you come across Solidity um, or Ethereum more generally. We are very much stuck to that paradigm. The token that we are issuing onto the Ethereum blockchain is just using the standard <laughs> Ethereum token interface. There is no I'll be honest, I'm, I'm going to stand here openly as the CTO and say there's no technical genius going on here. What's really interesting is kind of the operational component factored with the Ethereum token covered by that regulatory umbrella. So what we do is we, let's say you want 100 digital pounds worth of, uh, of these tokens. You essentially send us 100 pounds. We're a regulated financial institution. You can wire it to us in a, you know, potentially a range of forms. We're looking to put a payment gateway in so you can just do it on your credit card if that's what you were looking to do. And 
we would hold that money in what's known as a client segregated bank account. So this is like an FCA reg oversight. They give their oversight to these client segregated accounts. That really means that if we go bankrupt, we can't touch that money, nor can an administrator. It means that money is safe and would get re, you know, delivered out to people, you know, were we to go bankrupt. Um, the idea is that you send us the money. Once we can acknowledge receipt of those funds, we will issue the tokens to wherever you have, which would ever address you have requested they be sent to. We need to perform some kind of some background checks on you, some you know, some KYC, know your client checks again from a regulatory point of view to know who you are. But once that's done, you've got these tokens and you can do what you like with them. They are, as we see them, essentially digital banknotes. They behave exactly like a banknote. There's almost no difference, apart from the fact that you can now interact programmatically with your banknote, which is pretty cool. We are, and I'm normally careful how many people I say this to because it, it, it can start to raise some other concerns. We are essentially acting like a central bank. In fact, we, we essentially are behaving like a central bank. Um, it has some implications. You know, I'm not sure how you'd value a central bank, for example. But... Um, you know, it, it's the fact that it is, you know, has regulated your oversight is the thing that, you know, we really consider to be actually be the very powerful thing. And we have a number of clients who are interested in using this who, who wouldn't use it if there wasn't that regulatory backing to it. So that's very important to us. Um, I originally got interested in this because my background is uh, banking for my sins. Um, yeah, keep the booze to a minimum, please. Um, we... <laughs> We, we really got into this because, like Nick said, you can't get away from the blockchain in the financial technology space right now, nor would you want to. Um, the current model for, if you actually take a foreign currency transaction for us, is pretty much someone comes to us with their sterling. They say, I want to make a euro payment, but I don't have a euro bank account, nor do I have any way of getting hold of two million euros. So they come to us, we take the sterling, we go to the bank or the street or the FX marketplace and we do a foreign currency transaction. It'll take two days for that to settle and to move actually those final, that euro payment on to the final payee. This has got a number of risks. It's two days for the payee to send us the money and two days for us to get the payee, the beneficiary, the final beneficiary, their money. That's two days of credit risk, as I see it. That's two days too long for someone to go bankrupt and for the money to just never arrive. So what we would be able to do if there were national currencies on the blockchain is for someone to say, hey, look, I've got some digital sterling already. You'd hope they have it already. You'd hope that this stuff was kind of in circulation and being used. And we say, OK, fine, we'll use a smart contract to act almost like an escrow. Two parties can simply put their, you know, put their sterling in one side, their euro in the other side, and, and can just exchange instantaneous settlement, no settlement risk, no credit risk, um, and it's instantaneous, which is pretty nice. Everyone gets their money straight away. Brilliant. So additional benefits, though, specifically of actual the national currencies on the blockchain or the fiat currencies on the blockchain are things like this that Nick talked about. One of the first things that came up for the British government when they were looking at the use of blockchain technologies was conservative government, how do we cover making sure people can't spend their benefit money on things they shouldn't be spending it on? Um, so this is a pretty interesting way of being able to do this. This means that if you were to take this national currency um, and you were to, you know, to wrap it in various smart contracts, you can start to do some very powerful things with it. You can, if you want to, and if that's deemed appropriate, you can control where the money is spent. Um, not to mention all of the other interesting things you can do with it. Um, if anyone's familiar with foreign currency markets, people regularly want to buy or sell money based on sorts of triggers. You could use Oracle Eyes or something else to, you know, to trigger events that occur um, and move money based on the back of those events. There's all sorts of cool things you can do. So, right, and this is the point actually. Like I said, there's no technical genius going on here. I'm taking your money, I'm giving you some tokens, and I'm giving you the promise backed by the FCA that when you want your money back, I'll give it to you back. And that money is safe whilst we hold it. 
There's nothing revolutionary going on there. But finding someone who is prepared to do that, who understands the banking sector, who understands the ethereum world, and has enough kind of ability to interact with the regulators or the background to interact with the regulators, those things have not yet been combined. Um, there are certain competitors out there to products like this, but none of them have regulatory oversight. Probably one of the most significant c companies is based in Panama. Sounds like great for them, but probably not so great for me. So um, I'm going to try and kind of rattle through here, but you know, real money on the blockchain, it provides you know, all sorts of benefits. I mean, here we're talking about providing pri a private sector alternative in a regulated fashion. Um, Regulators, an alternative for APIs, exactly. I mean, this is, this is one thing, trying, like as Nick mentioned, actually trying to get banks. It's very easy to find an API where someone's going to be prepared to FX and hedge your FX market risk. It's very diff different finding a bank that's actually going to be prepared to settle those currencies. Um, extraordinarily difficult to settle, say, Garnon or Kenyan shilling, for example. You could start doing that with this with you know, considerably greater ease, with considerably greater protection. Again, removing that credit risk, which is often a concern in those areas. Um, Internet of Things, microtransactions. It enables microtransactions in a way that you know, has just not been done before. Um, you can do microtransactions with any cryptocurrency, I guess, but it's not backed by a central bank. It's not a real currency. It's not necessarily something that anybody outside of this room, for example, would want to carry around with them. Let's be honest, in my mind, could take some heat for this, not everybody wants to carry Bitcoin around. People, want, people like sterling. The public at, at large, they, they like their pound sterling. They want to keep their pound sterling. I like the idea that we could bring it to them in another fashion. They're going to have the money in their bank account, the notes in their pocket, and maybe the national currency on their phone. Foreign exchange on the blockchain, something you can do off the back of this. Again, automated via smart contracts, but I won't necessarily dwell on that too much. But Again, it makes the remittance market particularly interesting. TransferWise claim to be able to peer-to-peer -peer match all of your effects. You would no longer need TransferWise to peer-to-peer -to -peer match your effects. If you want to exchange money with someone, you would just be able to instantaneously do it. You no longer need to give up that 1% fee. Nick, all um, yours, man. Yeah, sure, thank, thank you, Dave. Uh, so I mean, if, if if you've heard what you know, if you've been listening and you're sort of trying to draw comparisons, like oh, are they a little bit like like this one company or this one company? Uh, we we think we're a little bit like each one of the companies listed there, uh, with some uh, and with each one of them in comparison, we have some differentiating factors. Again, being onshore, regulated on a public blockchain. Uh, and, and, and what you see on the other side of the slide is the market size, the current global you know, market size for the payments industry. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge, 650 billion pounds per day. I mean, it's, it's you know, we're, we're just a drop in the ocean. Most, most big companies you read about is just a drop in that big ocean. So it's a huge space with a lot of uh, uh, you know, opportunities for, for multiple players. Um, You know, this this is uh, so. Going back to our, our business model, we've come from a sort of conventional uh, FX to to uh, FX done by APIs, and we do believe the future is uh, FX on the blockchain. Uh, I mean, we'll see in the next two to three years if it doesn't materialize, then we'll have to substitute FX on the blockchain with something else. But for for the moment, we're quite bullish. Uh, we we think we're the right people to do this because we have an established. Uh, uh, you know, op an operating and growing uh, financial business, and because we're regulated, uh, and and we'd like to think that we're the center of uh, the center of the universe. Yeah, everybody thinks the center of the universe. But uh, yeah. So I mean, if if you're interested in our company history, uh, I mean, this is public information. We've put it on here uh, for everybody to get an idea of uh, when the company was. Uh, registered, you can see this on Companies House. You can change, uh, check our license information on the uh, the, the, the register of uh, the FCA, um, and you can see we we. By the way, something I forgot to mention: we received a grant from Innovate UK, which is uh, an agency of the British government responsible for 
uh, innovation. And uh, we're developing uh, an FX settlement prototype using blockchain technology, and we're planning to start commercializing it in January 2017, which is uh, th 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 uh, our wonderful uh, management team. And if you want to get in touch, that's our information. So I think at this point we will open to Q&A. Uh, we're going to pass this microphone, and we have another microphone at the front. So I'm not sure, Nicole, do you want to run up the stairs with the microphone, or how, how are we going to do this? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, my, I'm just in front. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Arif. Um, so I had a couple of questions. So the first thing uh, was a question on whether if you were providing the currency or you're essentially enabling the network to f onboard market makers which are providing currency. Um, and the second thing is, how do you guys make money? So, okay. We're very much in testing phase with the fiat currency on the blockchain. So any partners that we're partnering with right now, we're not making any money. We have, we have an existing FX business that makes plenty of money. Um, this is the start is as an R and D project for us, which is now getting increasingly serious, and we would look to commercialize in the future. But right now, we're, we're not. Um, in terms of your first question, the aim really is to allow anybody to put their hands on the fiat currency, not anyone in particular. The idea is that if you, it really is. I do. I, I'm, I keep coming back to this concept of these banknotes. If you if you leave some digital sterling with us. Or if you sorry, if you leave some real sterling with us or some real euro with us, we will give you the corresponding one-to-one -one value in the digital tokens, uh, with the promise that we will exchange them back if you'd like to do so in the future. Um, what you then do with those tokens, entirely up to you. Very similar to the banknote, really. Once they're in the wild, they're in the wild. Um, does that does that kind of corresponding value to to what? Corresponding value to the pound. So economically, the reason you have to retain a full reserve, f and so absolutely everything, we can't do anything with that money. Where do you get the price from? Pardon? Where do you get the exchange price from? Oh, we don't. No, sorry, you don't need an exchange price. I'm saying if you give me five pounds, mm. I will give you tokens worth five pounds. And like the central bank, if I'm going to hold your five pounds in reserve, your tokens now have value of five pounds in the same way that historically you would give your gold to the central bank they would issue you with a note that you can carry around and you can spend and you can return for your gold at a point in time it's just that here you would peg it one to one uh, and it's the full reserve that allows us to hopefully retain that value hope they there's always a small chance that they trade at a premium but we'll see Yes, yes. That's, we are under no illusions that unless lots of people want this, mm, it doesn't work very well. So um, how available is the currency at the moment? The, the tokens, it's not at all available at the moment. We, um, we launch in uh, this month. Uh, we're actually, our first partners are in the room. Alice is somewhere kicking around. Oh, hey, guys. Um, we're working with these guys first as our, um, as our kind of our first partners. Um, it's not out in the pu it's not out to the public yet it will be on the public blockchain but the as i said we need to kyc and get checks off with uh, various regulators with who we would work with first so so can i just check i understand then so are you saying that for example fx market makers could be clients of yours and use your bank account facilities to make a market and therefore enable effectively same day or instantaneous. Yeah, so now I'm at risk of people throwing things at me. But my, my background I, prior to this, I spent seven years at Goldman Sachs. Um, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't load Goldman's up with a bunch of this stuff, load JP Morgan, load maybe the other 10 kind of leading FX banks on the street up with this. And from an interbank settlement point of view, they just settle between themselves using this stuff instantaneously. So yes, from a market making point of view, you could, you could do this. At which point it really might start trading at a premium because of the lack of credit risk. You can arguably discount. But. I'm not sure I really understand the credit risk side of things. When you put the pounds that you receive 
in a bank account, which bank account are you putting it in? And sure. I know you say it's segregated and that you're working with the regulator. Does that mean they're backing it and guaranteeing it or what? I mean, isn't there still a risk of the bank's liquidity? Which, I mean, can you, can you yeah, share information on custody risk? So, okay, so the credit risk I'm really talking about is current existing credit risk. If you, do an, you and I do an FX trade right now, for example, we agree on the price of euro dollar. I'm going to give you some euros, you're going to give me some dollars. But there's not actually an expectation for me to deliver you those euros or you to deliver me those dollars until two days' time. Which means we can have agreed a rate the markets can be moving against me or in my favor. And in two days time, you can phone me and be like, sorry, Dave, don't go on. At which point I'm out and I've potentially exposed myself to two days worth of volatility in the market. And I could make a very significant loss or a very significant gain. That's the credit risk I'm talking about. I'm talking about my exposure to you once we've done the FX. In the context of the bank that where we hold the money, yes, our clients, people who use this product, they are exposed to that bank. And the bank will be regulated. There will be protection you know, from the bank um, under standard FCA regulation. But let's be honest, if we put all of our money with Lehman Brothers and they completely vanish, it's going to take a few years for administrators to, to sort that all out. Um, so that there, is, you know, there is an element there. What we would love to be able to do is store our money with a central bank. And the Bank of England are talking about potentially opening up bank accounts, but we think they're a little way away from that. Hopefully, if we go to market with something like this, it might kick them into gear a little bit. Nick, you can take a few. Uh, do you want to get some water? Yes. Hi, my name's Daniel. Um, so my question is, if, I, if I'm interested in the remittances market, right? And I, I don't really, perhaps you can expand a bit on that. If, if I wanted to set myself up as a as a competitor to Western Union, right? So I would get money in for people who want to send it to their granny in Colombia, uh, in some village in the middle of nowhere. How do I work? How would someone like that work with you in this? Would you like to take that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Go all night if you like. So let's start with, do you want, do you want to do the effects or do you just want to send the money? I just, you know, I, no one cares about how the money, what happens. Is it, they just care that the money, that the money comes in and it ends up with their granny, right? So, sure. what would I do, you know, in that use case, as, as someone who's basically in effect just setting themselves up as a money changing business or something, so receiving some money and trying to put it in somewhere in another country? For your specific scenario, your gran would have to want digital currency. Or, you know, you would, need, you would need a model which could emerge in the future where she could then exchange that money locally for cash, for example. You would imagine that that was, that was probably going to be a service. Cash machine is essentially how that would work. Um, and we do have partners who are interested in rolling out cash machines for this. So let's envisage a scenario where, you know, maybe your granny lives in the US, you've got some US dollar and you can give it to us, we'll give you digital dollars. You immediately and instantaneously just move it to her address, to her Ethereum address I'm talking about there, at which point she could exchange it in an ATM for cash, one for one. Um, does that kind of? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but then in what way is it different from me, say, buying a lot of Bitcoin and sending her the Bitcoin? Um, it's not, apart from the fact that Bitcoin price could change a bit in 48 hours or however right. long it takes to get there. Uh, it, de it totally depends on whether you, from in that context, it, it's no different from Bitcoin, apart from the fact that one of them is Bitcoin and one of them is pound sterling or US dollar. And there are some differences there with one being a central bank backed currency and one of them being a standard cryptocurrency. Um, Yeah. Have I heard of Tether? Was that? Yeah, te Tether dollars. So if, if you trade on Poloniex, you can use Tethers as a settlement mechanism. It's conceptually very similar. Uh, I'm not aware if they hold uh, reserves and, and how they hold them and what they regulate, if they regulate it or if they're onshore or offshore. I, I don't know, so I can't comment. But yeah, conceptually, it's very similar. 
Y yes, but what I'm saying is I don't know how that peg is enforced, whether they're using some, some uh, complex technical algorithms or whether they're holding full reserve, whether that reserve is in a segregated status in which country. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel. So, so um, my question is uh, about how you operate all this thing. Let's say uh, you've said that you have a segregated account for every customer and more or less you have two balances, one on the account, another one in uh, in tokens on the smart contracts. Let's, and the uh, transfers and tokens are settled quickly on the blockchain, but the transfers and accounts are not so quick. So how do you manage to do uh, to ensure that these uh, balances are synchronized. And another question is, let's say I receive a money on your uh, system, and uh, so I've got this settlement on the blockchain, so I've got some money on my balance and tokens, but immediately I would like to get money from the account itself, but you didn't settle it yet. So how you handle this situation too? So, that, so that's a, a good one. Let's, let's take the first one. Um, actually, let's take the second one. Your, if the money has not actually physically reached us yet, then yes, you are limited. There is a, a kind of a, a loose idea here that's maybe a little bit hopeful that you know when you want your digital currency, you're, you are in the long term, people will keep their digital currency and that's what will be used. So yes, if you, when you send us the money, there could well be a 24 hour delay in you sending us the money. You won't get your tokens until we've got the money. Um, and when you want your money back, it could take us 24 hours for you to get you, you know, the cash into your bank account. Um, in that case, it's, you know, there is some settlement delay. Yes, definitely. Again, the implicit assumption here is that you want those tokens because you're going to keep them for a period of time. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, cool. So, in terms of the first one, in what we're really interested in is it again like releasing the banknotes into the wild. What we care about is making sure that the total number of tokens in circulation matches the total amount on the bank account. And that's actually a very easy check to do. You can simply inspect the blockchain for, to see how many tokens there are in existence. The tokens can't be destroyed apart from by us. Um, so they're out there, they are in circulation, and then you just check that the balance in the bank account matches the balance on the blockchain. Uh one more question. You just, you just said that you will not receive your tokens until we've got the money on the account. Back Does it mean that the settlement still really connected to the money on the account? And yes, it is. And actually, that's very significant for the So FX. it means that my balance on tokens will not be changed until you've got money on the, my segregated account. So it's at the same uh, time for settlement, right? Yes. And when we're not claiming, I mean, this is, this is a very important part for the FX. We're not claiming that right now, as soon as you put these tokens there, that we can solve the FX problem for, a, for anybody immediately. It only works if the, both parties are interested in having the digital tokens and retaining the digital tokens. Settlement of the tokens is instantaneous. And if people want those tokens and they can be used for other things, then there's value, you know, which is why we're working with ATM providers, we're working with gate payment gateways, we're working with merchants who would potentially accept them so that they become a commonplace currency that is, is used across the board. But if you want to say, do an FX transaction and you've got to wire me the sterling, we wait until we've got it, we issue you the tokens, you convert it for some euros and then we wait to settle those euros, that's not really gonna have sped anything up for you. Does that, that make sense? Yes, thanks. I mean, j just to add from my side, so we're working on the assumption that in the future, central banks will willingly want to issue digital currency on a blockchain, either their own blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain or some other blockchain. So, so in the future, a lot of these things will be just natively possible. But until then, we would like to be able to, to take care of this in the private sector and hopefully do it right with, with uh, support from everybody. So, uh, so we, we, you know, we have a long-term vision, uh, but I mean, there's still a long way until we get there. Yeah. Uh, probably one more question to get to the bottom of that, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's say if I receive money in the tokens, you mean I will not be able to use it until like into the, uh, with delay two days? No, no. So, so in theory, once you have the tokens, uh, we, you know, we're working with merchants who want to accept the token as, as a means of payment. Uh, we're working with, uh, you know, existing cryptocurrency payment gateways where in addition to their 20 crypto, they want to add a stable coin like ours as, as an additional option. 
So, I mean, we, we have to build out the whole ecosystem because it's just not there at the moment. Uh, so in the future, hopefully, you will get your tokens and be able to spend them right away or, 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 or send them to a smart contract for, to do something. Yeah. Once you've got your tokens, you can do anything you like with them. Yeah, if you can right. find someone that's prepared to take them as payment, you can spend them. <laughs> Why do you call it a token? Could be a, could be a cryptocurrency. It could be a cryptocurrency, but it uses the Ethereum token interface because it's a common programmable interface that Solidity developers are experienced with. Hey guys, so talking about this from a trading perspective, so say for example, <laughs> good one. Um, say for example, all the streets on the bank sign up to this, oh, sorry, all the banks on the street sign up to this. Um, they each have digital sterling, euro, dollar, yen, for example. And they all tra trade between themselves. So the exchange rates will essentially be defined OTC, okay? Um, they'll trade with each other and eventually as it starts becoming more prominent within the market, eventually exchanges will start coming up to determine exchange rates between your digital currency. How do you ensure parity between the digital equivalent um, of the currency and the actual physical real currency? Because for example, I could come to you and I could say, give me 100 pounds and I want 100 pounds worth of uh, digital sterling. But for example, it's trading at 86 pounds on an exchange, for example. How do you ensure that parity? So FX is all OTC across the board. Um, there's, it's that full reserve concept. So economically, there is, there's the concept of a, a partial reserve or a full reserve. Um, what the full reserve does is means that if you've got your tokens, um, you could exchange them back for the full amount. So let's say you find someone, you're able to buy them for 88 pence on the pound, then that's like the world's greatest arbitrage opportunity. Because you're going to want to, I highly recommend you go out and you just buy as many of those guys as you possibly can. Because you can exchange them for, you know, considerably more worth when you come back to us and get your money back. So that's what stops it happening. The market just stops it from happening. Anybody that's prepared to sell you them at a discount is a real idiot. Um, the really interesting one is going to happen is if they trade at a premium are they more valuable than normal pounds because you can interact with them programmatically? My inclination is probably not, um, but it's possible. So that's what keeps them pegged, basically, the full reserve, the fact that you know at all times you can come back for your money and they were, will be exchanged for that amount, in the same way that the Bank of England retains the value of the pound. Okay, quick questions. How, how about this? Um, let's say um, you've got 10 million pounds worth of coins in circulation, um, someone sends a million pounds to buy a million pounds worth of your tokens. The bank recalls that money because it was fraudulently transferred to you. Won't you have a, um, a credit risk of like a million pound hole in your book and your currency is unbalanced by that time? So in that situation, you're talking about the money hits our bank account. We've got the million pounds. We issue the tokens, but the bank issues a recall. Right. At that point, we go into negotiation with the bank. We can also pull those tokens back if we really want to. Like, we have, as the issuer, like I said, we act like a central bank. Where that token's been spent, do you pull it back from another third party that has exchanged it? So that's a very good point. So at this point, we need tools to track, you know, what's going on and how to pull this back. But that's exactly why the FCA is involved. That's exactly the same model as I wire you some euros, you wire me some sterling, and then someone rec recalls it. That actually just doesn't happen when you're talking about a million pounds. Does that happen with Bitcoin? Sorry? Does that happen with Bitcoin? Does it? No, it doesn't. No, that wouldn't happen with Bitcoin. Um, because, well, it's Bitcoin. Um, in this specific scenario, though, there are regulatory agreements in place to handle those kind of situations. In exactly the same way as if I wire you the corresponding amount of euros, you wire me the sterling, and then the bank like makes a recall but actually in the kind of banking infrastructure we're talking about that doesn't happen like one bank can't just recall from a bank account a million pounds um they would have but to the compliance them. officer can freeze it sorry the compliance officer can freeze it precisely yeah precisely they can um, freeze anything they like at any time they like yeah. if they don't like whatever's going and on. actually in this specific scenario the fca would be pretty pissed with us if we didn't freeze it so what would happen to the program? sorry So here's a really interesting one. I'll be interested in hearing people's thoughts about this afterwards. But 
there's absolutely nothing to say right now that we couldn't freeze the assets. But that's an interesting question. Do you... People like the fact that we're backed by a regulator, and the regulator might say, freeze the assets. Freeze, freeze the million pounds, freeze the assets, I want to know what's going on. Or someone gets wind, a government gets wind that they're maybe moving to someone on our sanctions list. Freeze the assets. Here's all you know, legal stuff to say that you need to do that. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, and that's, you know, something that's, that's out there. I and mean, that's something actually we're still discussing with regulators. So that's something that we have to put in. Is that a regulatory requirement or not? Because I was thinking, like, in this, um, in this situation, if, if you've got companies using your money mm. and a company has that money in their possession and they're using that and it suddenly gets free, so you record it. Yeah. You call the, you oh, yeah. Physical. Massive problems. Massive problems. We are acutely aware of that, so the FCA. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I think that that's an excellent discussion. You guys should move it to the pub later on. Because uh, I, I do want to get a few more questions. I still see quite a, quite a few hands. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of on a related topic, but it seems to me that you're issuing a digital representation of pound sterling. You're effectively issuing a security, really. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we've been in Bitcoin and these sorts of things is that Bitcoin is not a regulated instrument. And the FCA has just said, you know, Bitcoin, whatever, go for your life. Don't, we don't care. It's outside of our parameters. As soon as you do this, you're effectively crossing a live wire, and and I think it's a very dangerous regulatory territory for you. So, I mean, you do realize you're going into the whole area of issuing securities to retail investors and and all the all this sort of thing. Um, I think I think it's extremely yeah. dangerous. Have you have you considered all that? So we are we are we're very much B two B. So we don't we don't deal directly with consumers. Some of our partners may have. May, may have consumers and they have to manage those relationships and we, we work very closely with the FCA and they do want to understand every step of the way, what are the risks, how is the ultimate consumer protected, etc. Uh, so, the, the, but, but yeah, the point is that's why we're working very direct closely with the regulator. We're not trying to do this behind uh, their backs or, or, or in a offshore unregulated environment. Uh, the other thing is because I, I you know, I, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin, by the way. I have Bitcoin on my, my phone. I think it has its uses. But in terms of uh, mass adoption, I, I've given lectures on Bitcoin two years ago, three years ago, four years ago to various audiences. And some of the questions that always come up is, well, who is this backed by? Which government is backing this? You know, what, uh, how, how is this regulated? You know, what if the exchange runs away with my money? Who guarantees the exchange rate, etc.? So we, 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 we're trying to... You know, I mean, Bitcoin is great. I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I use it. I recommend it to people. But it has some, uh, let's say, niche applications in, in, in my view. And what we're trying to do here is to issue, you mentioned the word security. From a regulatory perspective, what we're trying to do is called e-money, which is a different regime. It's actually the same money that's in your PayPal account. It's an e-money license. Yeah. Same principle. That's, the, that's another analogy I like to draw, and it's the PayPal analogy. Hi, Block Paul. Yeah. Um, one of the announcements that was made at DevCon in Shanghai recently was by Santander, who seemed to be doing something quite similar to this. I'm afraid I wasn't there, so if anyone can help me understand. Uh, is what you're doing the same, or if so, if not, what, what are the differences? So according to the media reports, it's very similar. I don't know how far they are in terms of pilots, in terms of uh, partners. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm not sure, because there, there was... Uh, there was an announcement at DEF CON where the company doing it was uh, regulated out of Panama. So I'm not sure if that's no, the same one or if that's a different one. I'm the, this, the Santander scenario, my understanding is that what they've done is if you imagine, the reserve is obviously quite key to this and you can obviously tell by the number of questions around it. What Santander have done is they have an internal pool of money and if you want to wire money to someone else at Santander right now, that's going to be a pretty, that's actually going to be a surprisingly laboriously, surprisingly laborious process for them. Um, they've actually almost done like internal, um, internal netting, so that all of the money is kind of sat in a central pot. And then when, if you want to money, wire money to someone else at Santander, you can do it and it's done on the blockchain. So it's kind of a similar system, but it's private in the context of Santander. That's my understanding of it. Please jump in if... Okay, one more question. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, just one quick question about KYC. Um, do people who deposit and withdraw money, are they the only people who have to be KYC'd in your system, or do any, does any recipient of the token have to be KYC'd? And one more question, can anyone become KYC'd? If I live in Nigeria, say, will you KYC me, or are there limits to that as well? Thank you. Um, only those interacting with us need to be KYC'd. So if you want tokens or you want to retrieve tokens, they're the only points of KYC required. Um, same as with your bank, again, back to cash. If for in order to open the bank account, they're going to KYC check you. Once you pull your cash out of your bank account, you do whatever you like with it. Um, and there are no fees. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> there are no fees right now. So right can now, we can we just take take this afterwards? You Definitely. can talk to them; they'll be here. So and we've yes, got other presentations too. We already KYC check people all over the world, including Nigeria. So that's just part of our regular business model that we do doing FX. So.